uh, from now on. Um, so uh, it will be put online for dissemination purposes. So please be aware of that if there's uh, anything that you don't want recorded. Right. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. As you can see, we've got a packed agenda over the just next hour and a little bit. Um, we will give you a brief introduction to sharing cities and indeed uh, a bit of an introduction to the digital social market before we go into the detail of how this has been implemented within the, in two of our lighthouse cities, in this case, London, Greenwich and Lisbon. And then we will talk through a couple of the really important and useful replication tools that are coming out of sharing cities now and are very useful for those who are considering uh, implementing the digital social market, in this case, uh, in their city as we go forward. Uh, then we'll have the Q&A and discussion with everyone and then we'll bring everything to a close at the end. We have... Uh, an all-female panel for you, which is always good to see. Um, we have uh, Gemma Hoare, who will be, is from the Royal Borough of Greenwich in London, who will be presenting on how they have implemented digital social market there. And Diana Henriquez from Lisbon and Nova, who are one of our partners in, um, in sharing cities and have been integral to the project. Uh, so just quickly, an introduction to sharing cities. Um, if you join us for the uh, subsequent webinars in this series, you might be, get a little bit sick of me telling you about this, but uh, it's uh, important context, I think, uh, for the rest of the webinar. We have our three lighthouse cities. So um, sharing cities is one of the now 17 smart cities and communities um, cohort of projects that are funded by Horizon 2020. Uh, we started the project in 2016. Um, so it was the second second year of those. We follow a similar course to, to most of them in having uh, some lighthouse cities who are doing the implementation and then the fellow cities who are working uh, around replication. And then obviously a key element of the project is really getting those smart city solutions and the lessons that we have learned out to a much wider audience and encouraging other cities to adopt those measures as well. And that's really one of the purposes of this webinar series is to really um, help other cities understand the measures, understand the potential of them, and to really help them start that process of replication and scale up. Sorry. Minor technical issue. Um, so as you can see from there, there are 10 particular measures that we've implemented as part of sharing cities. So we will, uh, some of these will be clustered for the purposes of the webinar series, um, as they have quite a lot in common, as you can imagine. So today's one will be digital social market and the next one in a couple of weeks time is e-bikes and we will share the calendar with you at the end and it is also on our website. But as you can see, broadly, these are around around the sort of platforms for engagement and data, around e-mobility, around uh, building retrofit, uh, sustainable energy management systems and smart lamp posts. Um, the sort of principle or philosophy, if you want, for uh, sharing cities has really been about the integration of place, people and platform. And this is a really important part of the, um, of the project and it's, Sorry, someone is not on mute, so could you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's a very important uh, underpinning of the project because none of these things can work without the other. It's really important to understand how they all work together and that these impl the implementation of measures is really um, designed uh, with these things in mind and these elements included in the sort of co-design process. In terms of this webinar series, it's very much focused around uh, building capacity and exchanging on these topics um, and, and really understanding uh, some of the more technical elements around these solutions and understanding the tools that are, have been developed to help you take that further within your city. As I said, the webinars are being recorded as well and put on our website, so you'll be able to share them with others in your cities or elsewhere, as well as going back to them for reference if that's something that you would find useful. So what is a digital social market? It's um, 
perhaps a little bit hard to tell from that term, but it sounds exciting and it is exciting. Um, the key elements of digital social market, it's essentially a platform or a tool that cities can use to engage with citizens and also to encourage um, behaviour change around um, some more pro-environmental behaviours, more sustainable behaviours within their city and can really help to align that around some of their own um, uh, sustainability priorities as well. So encouraging, for example, things like increased uh, cycling or walking or more sustainable purchasing behaviour and a whole range of different things. It really does depend on what is important to the city and how they engage their citizens. So particularly in this time where we're perhaps a little more remote from each other in the physical sense, it can be an incredibly useful um, a tool to work more closely with your citizens and for them to really feel like they're part of a movement in terms of really engaging with the city's priorities and objectives and to make it a greener and more pleasant place to live. And it is essentially sort of using a platform and usually a smartphone app as the key points of engagement. Uh, often using um, elements of competition. Um, this is something that a lot of behavioural research suggests helps people to change their behaviour and to engage more. So that element of competition between people to, to do better, to do more, to be a bit greener is a really important component of the project as well. Um, and as you'll see in a moment, uh, these have been applied quite differently in our lighthouse cities. And you'll see from Lisbon and Greenwich that they've taken different angles to this and are really seeing some results for it as well in terms of citizen engagement. So what are the benefits? I think I've sort of covered some of these, but it's a really important citizen engagement tool. It can help people save money or do or, or, or feel good about themselves, I guess, in doing sort of uh, more positive environmental behaviours. It can help engage citizens in delivering the goals, the climate goals, for instance, or air quality goals, et cetera, for cities and really promoting those positive behaviours. And it's around community empowerment. Uh, local businesses can also be involved. And Sometimes it's also about creating those sustainable behaviours that actually really last, that they're not just a one-off uh, behaviour change, but become more of a habit for people in how they live their daily lives. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Gemma from Greenwich, who's going to talk us through how they've implemented uh, the digital social market in Greenwich. Good morning, everyone. So just bear with me while I take control of the slides. I think it's just loading up. <laughs> I'll start with that. It's, it's, there's a little screen that's whirring. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about Greenwich Energy Hero, which is um, our application of the digital social market. So um, as Brooke has said, you can, this is a kind of a framework that's been built that can be applied to different um, challenges. And ours is a different area of the project on sustainable energy management systems and this idea of residential demand side response, um, which I will talk you through in a second. Um, so just a couple of, uh, like I guess a bit of an introduction. So we brought three different programme partners on the Sharing Cities together to work on this challenge. Um, and it was really, really beneficial. I'm not just saying that because they might be listening on the call, but we really built a great partnership um, and brought different expertise to the table. So um, the Future Cities Catapult were our work package leads, they're experts in service design, um, and they coordinated and designed the DSM approach in all three cities. Kiwi Power are an energy aggregator, they're experts in demand side response. And then there's us from the Royal Borough of Greenwich, we're the local lead and we're really interested in providing, you know, a great service to our residents that meets their needs and also our ambitions around building a smart and sustainable city. So we had this challenge of building a digital social market about um, a demand side response and bringing together Future Cities Catapult's expertise about building great services, Kiwi Power's knowledge of um, of the energy market and our knowledge of our residents and the local challenge meant that we could build a really great service. So um, I'm presuming that demand side response might be a bit unfamiliar to some people. So I'm going to do as brief but understandable explanation of it as I can in the time allowed. 
So this is a graph from the UKPN, the UK Power Network, which shows um, the grey line is the load or the use of electricity. And as you'll see that there is a peak and the red solid line is the network limit. So the amount of electricity that can easily be provided by the power network. So the area in green there is the area of opportunity. So there are two ways we could address this. The first is on the supply side. So if we look at the supply of electricity to able to meet that, that real peak is pretty inefficient. So it involves things like keeping old coal power points, power plants online for occasional use. It involves reinforcing um, the electricity infrastructure so it can cope with occasional peaks. It also means that it's harder to use renewable energy sources because they only produce um, power intermittently. So when it's sunny or it's windy. So the idea of um, demand side response is instead of trying to address that peak on the demand side, no, it's on, the, on the supply side to address it on the demand side. So um, what in, instead of when there's high demand, instead of acting to increase supply, we reduce demand. It's a market that does currently exist in the commercial sector in the UK, and I'm sure in many of the countries that you might be in. Um, so companies with lots of refrigerators and lots of large machinery are given incentives from the national grid to use less electricity during these periods. And we want to see whether residential households can act consistently and reliably in a way to reduce their demand. It's not a market that currently exists in the UK, but as we want to use more green um, fuel sources, it might be something that we need to look at. So the next image you will see, this is a graph from one of our users. And you can see that kind of if the previous image was about the national level, that on the local level uh, in one household, the, the picture is, very, is pre pretty similar. So there's a period of about an hour where there's a real peak of electricity use. And if we can move that to other times of the day, then there could be a really great benefit on the um, electricity system. So um, we think um, the GLA estimates that there's about 0.5 gigawatts of domestic flexible power within London alone. And the demand side response could reduce the need to reinforce the network um, by about 30 million pounds just in London. And that those savings could be passed on con to consumers in lower energy prices. So that's the kind of the principle. What does it look like to our users? So what we're doing is we're simulating these signals from the electricity system operator. Um, and we're giving those signals to citizens we're incentivizing them via gamification via an app to reduce their energy consumption during peak times. We send them an alert once or twice a month. We ask them to use less electricity for an hour. They receive points for doing so. And at quarterly intervals, they can convert those points into prizes. Um, and I think what's really um, important to note about our solution, which I'll take you through in a minute, is that anyone can take part in this. You don't need to have you know, a smart connected washing machine. You don't need to have an electric vehicle. You don't need to be a homeowner that owns a house, um, not a flat that can put solar panels on the roof. It really, as long as you have access to your electricity meter and it's not too far from your Wi-Fi signal, you can take part in this service. I think it's also interesting that as opposed to some other residential demand side response trials, we're taking kind of a positive reinforcement. Um, you know, we'll give you points for doing the right thing rather than negative reinforcement, like we'll charge you more money for using electricity during these times. So how did we do this? I hear you ask. So our solution, the first thing we did was lots and lots of user research. We did um, online user research. We did user research going into people's homes. We did focus groups. We did a lot of review of materials that had already been done around this topic to kind of think, you know, what, how do we communicate the idea of demand side response in an attractive way to, um, to the people in Greenwich so that they, they, they want to sign up to this service? What do people think about it? What kind of behaviours do you think they're going to be able to change quite easily if we ask them to use less electricity for an hour? What might be more difficult? What language do they use around electricity so we can reflect that back to them when we're talking about it? So lots and lots of user research and it was really, really valuable. We then used all of that research to design a service journey and all the associated communication materials. We then did the recruitment and the install. So as you'll see on the left, we had to install bits of equipment in people's homes. It takes, so the install took about half an hour all in all, but it was a kind of about 10 minutes installing the equipment and uh, 20 minutes um, doing a survey for monitoring evaluation and really explaining the service. So we worked with a charity called Groundwork London, who were experts um, in talking to people about energy in their homes um, to do so. 
once it was installed in people's homes, they would get, get given access to the app. So you'll see the image on the left hand side um, tells people their live electricity use and it updates every six to 12 seconds. So if you compare that to the UK smart meters, which are every 30 minutes, it's not, it's, which isn't very granular. So every six to 12 seconds mean if you're anything like me, when you get it installed in your house, you run around turning on the kettle and plugging all your laptop and really getting a picture of how much electricity you're using. The dial in the middle kind of goes in different colours, so green, uh, amber, red for how much electricity is being used at the time. There's also historical um, uh, information, there's energy saving tips, and there's your hero status, um, which is how many points you've earned. And then obviously the real purpose of this trial was demand side response. So we then send these alerts um, again once or twice a week sorry, once or twice a month, um, and they usually last for an hour. They're usually in the evening. So um, we are people to use less electricity. We calculate that, that based on um, a baseline, which is a rolling um, four week period looking at their highest electricity use. We then take look at the percentage reduction against that rolling four week uh, highest electricity use and assign them points um, based on that. They do also get some points for kind of using the service outside of the peak response um, time. So, you know, if this is happening once a month, we still want to get people involved. So just by logging into the app, by reading some of the energy saving tips, you still get points. But most of them are around um, energy alerts. The points can then be donated to a, in, to a charity um, or convert into a shopping voucher um, every quarter. Um, at the moment, only one person has chosen the voucher um, and everyone has chosen to donate to our charity, which is the local community hospice. So a little bit about results. I think first um, it's important to say that we're almost six months through the kind of the full service running. So kind of getting out of the beta mode and into kind of a full running service. So kind of the real burning questions that we wanted to answer about whether residents can act consistently and reliably and about the business model, we haven't yet answered. But we have got lots of really great results around kind of the behavioural and the attitudinal stuff. So um, how are people using the service? What are they doing when they get an alert? So the first thing to say is, you know, that generally the people that are using it really like the app and the, the fact about just having more information about their electricity use outside of the, the peak response alerts has really helped people use the less elect electricity. We've also recently done a survey to kind of find out about behaviour and attitudes. So some key things to take out there is the idea of helping um, the electricity grid so that renewable energy can be used more in the future was a really great um, motivator. It wasn't the rewards that we're offering. Um, and then the things that people find easy to use, um, easier to use at a different time are things like washing machines and tumble dryers. Things that people find more difficult are the kitchen appliances. So, you know, the microwave, the kettle. Um, and basically, we've kind of we've got a, you know a quite small cohort, but a consistent cohort of people that are consistently acting when they get the results, the uh, the notifications. We're also um, beginning to spend quite a lot of time documenting our learnings, so that other cities, such as perhaps yourselves, can learn from what we've done. I think the real key issue we found um, that I'd highlight is this idea that you have to go and install equipment in someone's home. So we found that effective recruitment, people aren't that keen to do it. You know, this is before coronavirus and inviting someone into your home was still, you know, not something people did on a regular basis. Um, it, so it affects the number of people that sign up. We also got quite a lot of dropout between, yes, I'm interested in, this, in the service, but actually having to go and book um, an installation. People, a lot of people dropped out at that stage. It also means that when people drop out during the service, which I think is to be expected with any digital service, um, with there's kind of a, a bigger like loss in value, you know, that we've, put the time and the effort and the equipment in. Um, so I think that's it. Um, so I'm really happy to answer any questions at the end. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gemma. Uh, we will now move on to the uh, case study of Lisbon. Um, where we hopefully will get the slides moving on in a second. <laughs> um, hi, Diana. So we've got Diana here from Lisbon, uh, Lisbon and Nova, who's the, which is the energy agency of Lisbon, who will be telling us about how they have implemented the digital social market in the city of Lisbon, which is um, a little bit different from the approach that uh, Greenwich has taken. Um, I just... Sorry, Diana, we're just needing to move the slides on. Oh, there we go. Is it 
trying this. to click control. Have you got control? Uh, I asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have control. So okay. to the next slide. Um, okay. Great. Perfect. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Thank you for inviting us to present our um, our pilot. Um, actually, uh, I must say our uh, pilot, it, it started and it finished already uh, because we did it during a school year um, and we worked with all our partners from sharing cities. So we had a different, uh, we had many different roles on this uh, process. Um, we, I will address, uh, I will explain a bit how, uh, how did it work and I will address the challenges and the solutions uh, during these explanations and in the end um, all the challenges that lay ahead. Um, so um, after we had a long process of co-design and user research, what we uh, concluded, what we uh, agreed on is that uh, we would uh, work on a process that uh, for exchange of goods and services supported by an application, um, uniting uh, citizens through a common cause. And we, we chose the cause, um, the school. So uh, schools, different schools, to engage the community around also these schools, um, mostly the ones near to these schools. Um, so what we chose to do was um, with this program was launched in the November 2018 and finished in uh, 2019. So it was during a school year, as I, I said before, um, because it was focused very much uh, inside uh, these, these three schools. Uh, they had the different areas of Lisbon inside the, the the area of implementation of a sharing cities uh, program. Uh, so we involved around uh, 4,500 4, students from 13 to 15 years old uh, from these three neighborhoods uh, involving around uh, 100, 130,000 people. Uh, we involved also a local shop network around 20, uh, 20 shops on this um, three neighborhoods and we went we involved um, the parishes which are uh, in Portugal they are the smallest uh, um, scale of um, um, administration local administration so we had these three uh, parishes so uh, these these are some photos of already uh, our program inside the schools uh, I must say that Although we focused very much on the schools, they were the, the center. Um, the purpose was to, um, to join all the community around the schools, like the teachers, the families, and then to spread it uh, more broader. Anyone in the city could, um, could participate. So uh, how did it work? Um, a, a person would uh, join and register at Sharing Lisboa. Uh, which is the name of the, the app, Sharing Lisboa. And they, they would uh, earn points through different behaviors. The behaviors uh, were uh, walk and cycle, uh, charging electrical vehicles, uh, saving energy at home, answer quizzes about uh, energy and mobility, and to uh, visit the local shops to earn points. They would uh, make a check-in in their app and then they would earn points. And therefore, their points were, were uh, contributing to do two different um, um, system, point system. So they would contribute to their own points and also to get uh, after bonuses in the shops and also to contribute to the bigger cause, which was the school. There were three schools, so they would choose the school. I want uh, to earn points contributing to a certain school, which usually is the school of my children, of the school of my neighborhoods, the closest school to me. Um, and then in the end of the challenge, 
uh, the school that had more points um, would um, get a prize uh, contributing to uh, energy refer refurbishment of this uh, of this school. Um, so this is are some print screens of the of the app. So as I said, uh, first we had the first uh, print screen. We have um, we can choose one of the three schools, and then we we have to connect with external accounts. Uh, to measure our behaviors. So for walking and cycling, uh, we had the Google Fit and for example, the EDP, which is the energy company also um, distribution. Um, they um, are in sharing cities uh, program. Uh, we also could join it to get uh, points concerning the energy um, consumption of the homes. Also, another very important um, parameter that was uh, being measured was the energy um, efficiency and the energy consumption of the schools. Every month um, we would measure how was the evolution of the energy consumption of the schools and this contribu contributed very largely to the, to, the, um, to the points of the school. So if, here you have on the right you have the dashboard uh, that had um, the, uh, the situation of each point last week, uh, how many points did I make, the total points uh, I am making to contribute to this school. So there are two kinds of points, my own points, which one from which I can earn bonuses and the bigger points, which are the points of the school. So there is a, a competition inside the competition or two levels of competitions, uh, we can say. Um, we also, in the app, we would get uh, information um, when we had uh, the receipts points. Uh, uh, in this second uh, print screen, we have uh, the quiz. We also had quizzes and these were interesting because they were very enjoyed by the, the students. They like, the young students, they, they like quick points. So uh, walking and cycling, it takes a long time to get these points. No, you have to do it every day. But uh, quizzes, they, they love it because they just answer and answer and, and they finish it very uh, quickly. So we had to put more quizzes because they were asking for it. Um, and on the right, we have uh, the, the, the local shops that were involved. They were increasing during the school year. Um, we also asked for help for the community to give us, um, to involve more and more um, um, shops uh, to join us. We had from restaurants to uh, hairdressers, uh, toy shops, uh, every kind of, um, of the local shops. Um, also, uh, we interacting with schools, we had um, we monitored their energy um, consumption. We also, so we had uh, uh, monthly reports on their energy um, performances. Uh, we made walking audits, uh, proposed uh, energy efficiency measures, and we had sessions about this with teachers and staff. Um, with students, we had uh, every month, uh, we had uh, different sessions in the school um, with the students. Uh, we had a kiosk that uh, were, were there to ask the students to join and to give information. We had also a champions team to involve the students, which was um, a group, a smaller group of, uh, of, um, of students that tried to involve more students and they also earned points for it and had different, um, a smaller gamification between them also. So it was also, a, as another kind of incentive um, in experience that we must we, must, we can say. Uh, so in the end, uh, this uh, is a picture of the, uh, the delivery of the reward that was given to the director of the, the school that uh, that one. In the end, they had quite a, a reduction of energy consumption um, in the end of the school year. Um, mm, some challenges uh, were connected with, for example, integration with platforms, not all the, all the data that
that we wanted to collect was possible. For example, the, um, with the sharing uh, uh, mobility apps, uh, we, didn't, we couldn't um, integrate with uh, all of them. Um, also, another important challenge on this kind of project is the engagement, the continuous engagement, to be able to, to, to engage people for a long time, not only in the beginning. So uh, one thing to go around this is that we gave extra points and we had um, periodic challenges giving extra points. For example, if you walk and cycle during, um, during uh, this uh, week, you get uh, double of the points. This is an example. And we also get feedback uh, to the users on the indicators. And um, we were, as I said before, expanding the local shop uh, network. So results, we had around uh, 1,030, uh, uh, 300 users, very much owed to the schools. Um, and uh, a lot of responses to the quizzes. So we had uh, 16 quizzes, uh, 7,500 responses. Uh, we counted uh, 16,000 kilometers traveled registered in the app, um, 5,000 check-ins in the local shops, and 20, uh, 258 claimed bonuses in these uh, shops. Um, so, uh, as as challenges, we we think uh, one of the greatest challenges to expand to the whole city, replicate in other business models. Um, it, uh, and do it in a more autonomous way. Uh, our model was not very autonomous because we really were uh, over working a lot with uh, with the schools um, and Dinam is uh, always uh, promoting activities and this was very important. So how to do it more autonomous, uh, how to do it going uh, to, to reach a level that you can have this uh, project and just let it flow and not going uh, all the time so much um, working on these activities. Um, another challenge is to integrate with other platforms, invest more on communication and dissemination. We didn't have a great uh, budget for communication, so we used a lot of this proximity of the, of the students in the school um, community. Um, and um, we think uh, a gamification is um, very um, useful for uh, for promoting this uh, this uh, behaviors, as we as we acknowledged. Um, and we would like to adjust this uh, uh, app to other formats. For example, not uh, using schools as the main uh, um, main cause, but other other kinds of common causes using it, for example, inside the companies, um, promoting other kinds of competitions, um, and creating a more dynamic um, of, uh, in network of incentives. Well, that's it for now. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Right. So just before we go to the question and answer session, we're just going to give you an introduction to uh, the key tools and guidance that has been developed by uh, Sharing Cities and the Greater London Authority as part of the Sharing Cities uh, project. Um, just a reminder, please put your questions in the chat box. Uh, once we go to the question and answer ses session, you can also raise your hands. Um, so just, uh, I will just give a very brief introduction to the smart booklets. Um, which are being developed for each of the smart city solutions within sharing cities. And you will uh, see them as one by one going up online on the sharing cities website uh, over the next couple of months. So there are some up there already and there will be more joining them. And the same goes for the uh, smart playbooks, which Sandy will be telling us about. I realized that in my introduction to speakers earlier, I neglected Sandy because she was up in the top right corner and I missed her. So sorry, Sandy, my apologies. Uh, San Sandy Tong is our uh, Sharing Cities Coordinator at the Greater London Authority um, and has also been leading on the development of the smart playbooks amongst many other things that she does. Um, so the smart, the smart booklets 
uh, really an introduction to each of the measures. It's a quick sort of snapshot, a whistle stop tour of, of the measures, what they are, how they've been implemented in our lighthouse cities, and some of the things that you need to consider if you're looking to implement those. And then I'll actually just hand over to Sandy now. I think, um, as you can see, that's what they look like. Handing over to Sandy, who's going to uh, talk you through the playbooks in more details because they um, a little bit of an explanation of those will really help you to be able to use those as you go forward. Sandy. Brilliant. Thanks, Brooke. Um, just trying to take control. OK, brilliant. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, um, so what Gemma and Dana from Greenwich and Lisbon have done really nicely is to explain to you the different use cases that um, that Greenwich and Lisbon have, uh, you know, the, the way that they applied the, uh, the digital social market in their context uh, to achieve their objectives. And so uh, what the playbooks have, uh, what we're trying to achieve is to try to really capture the lessons that were learned uh, across all three cities, actually Milan included as well as part of sharing cities, um, to really pull out um, not only the process of how of uh, and the concept of what the digital social market is, um, the benefits, um, but also the common learnings, the insights, um, so that what we've uh, learned across the three cities as a project um, can actually be distilled and, and captured in a way so that other cities who are looking to um, to implement similar initiatives uh, don't have to start from scratch and, and learn learn the, the lessons and the mistakes um, and also the positive things that have come out of our project. Um, so I'll just give you a, a sneak preview of uh, what the playbooks actually look like and um, I'll just explain that uh, basically we have uh, in our playbooks um, captured the entire process of, of uh, the digital social market. And this is the same for our upcoming other measures as well. We have um, we have uh, a playbook that's been published for, for e-bikes um, and a few more um, in the pipeline. Um, we've basically captured the entire process, as you can see on the right hand side. It's interactive. Uh, when you see the playbook, you can click through all these different, um, different uh, buttons uh, to understand uh, what the overarching kind of concept of the t of the solution is uh what the insights are um sorry, and what what the benefits are sorry, Manon. sorry Sandy, it's not, i'm really sorry to interrupt you uh, i just wanted to check with another guest can you see the screen because for me it's just blank so i just wanted to be sure that we could follow your presentation oh can someone tell me if they see the slide that sandy is presenting <laughs> I still have the introduction to the booklets and playbook slide on my screen. So. Oh, that's strange. Should I hand hand over my um, hand that back over to you? Can can I is that working at all? Just, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to. Ah, it. there we oh, go. It's okay. appeared now. Oh, <laughs> Take that was very strange. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about the interruption, Sam. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Anyway, I was just trying to explain uh, if you can see on the right hand side here, there are buttons that you can push um, to kind of take you through the, the playbook that takes you through the challenge and the solution, the insights, um, the benefits in terms of the uh, not only the financial and economic, but also the social, social and environmental benefits of implementing uh, a digital social market scheme. And then the really kind of juicy bit, which is the, the implementation toolkit, which is um, kind of taking you through you know, all the, the steps, step by step, how you actually um, want to uh, deploy a digital social market from all the way from kind of exploring the opportunity. So understanding your, your landscape, your context, understanding the impacts um, uh, to engaging your audience and engaging in technical design and co-design practices through to um, understanding different types of business models. So the Greenwich and Lisbon um, cases have uh, presented very, very different ways of um, uh, of using the app and, and um, different types of business models. Um, so we kind of present a few different ways that you can look at that, as well as uh, the, the ownership and governance structures. And then when you want to, um, when you've actually deployed it, how you can monitor progress um, to understand uh, whether it's performing to uh, to whether, uh, yeah, to, to, to your standards. And so, um, recognizing also that there's a lot more than we can really cover um, 
you know, there's templates and tools that we have identified in the t in, in the playbook um, kind of for you to really get a feel for um, what it takes to uh, to design and implement and roll out um, the digital social market. Um, you know, if there is something that piques your interest and you want to find out more, uh, please do get in touch with us um, either at the, the PMO, the Program Management Office uh, at the Greater London Authority, um, and you could, uh, we and we could put you in touch with the relevant partners um, and who are the real experts who can tell you, um, in terms of uh, um, the technical expertise, um, how you know uh, how you actually kind of use the tools um, and can share a bit more information with you. So I'm going to stop there and hand back over my um, controls. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I think I just stopped it. Manon, I don't know if you can re-reshare it. Yes, yes, I'm sharing it again. <laughs> Thank you. It's not a proper webinar without at least one technical mishap, so <laughs> I think we're doing all right here. Uh, right, so it's thank you very much for that, Sandy, and to uh, Gemma and Diana for their presentations as well. That was very. Um, very, very insightful. And I think uh, I'm going to speak on everyone's behalf and say it was very interesting uh, to understand how uh, the digital social market has been deployed in uh, different contexts and in different ways. Um, uh, just a reminder to participants, please, uh, any questions, please put them in the chat box or raise your hands. Um, with the raise hand function and we can hand over uh, the floor to you to ask your question. Um, I will start with a question, uh, if that's my moderator's privilege there, um, to both uh, Gemma and Diana really is to understand um, if you were to roll this out on a on a longer term basis or to a wider audience, um, what's the biggest sort of challenge to doing that? And um, is it something you're exploring? I can go first. Um, so I think as I um, suggested in um, my presentation, the real um, thing we need to crack is the fact that we have to install something in someone's home um, to get the data for this service to be able to work. Um, and it's a real challenge, you know, getting people um, to sign up and then having to install in people's homes. Um, we're thinking about solutions. We haven't cracked it. I mean, I think it would be ideal if the smart meter roll out in the UK had allowed access to data for lots of people and was on a more granular level, but it's not. So I think it's, um, it's you know, it's really about we're, we're collecting lots of research. There are other tr trials that are going on in the UK. It's about presenting that research and hopefully a, an attractive business model to the national uh, grid. Hopefully they get on board. And then once we have the business model on board, you know, looking at different actors. So whether energy companies get, get involved um, and that. So big challenge uh haven't got a solution but it is you know at the forefront of our minds as to something to fix great thanks diana um i think there are two uh, main challenges on that first uh, concerning our project um our model would have to be adjusted in the in the way that um i think uh, the most effective way to, to get people uh, joining in was um, around the schools. So we have we are limited by a school year, by um, uh, administration of the school. So we have a time a timing. No, so we uh, we had a prize. So we had um, uh, a date for finishing this. So we would have to adjust this to another model. And also, as I said before, as um, um a good a, a big challenge is to get an autonomous to do it autonomously to get um uh, to get a, a project that we don't have to be all the time uh, enforcing and remembering people to use it uh and this is a big a big challenge um we would like to try this as in, in smaller in other, other scales other kind of contexts like for example companies and that would be interesting uh, to understand in what kind of model we can uh, we can use this in another in what other ways we can use this. Thank you. Yeah, it does sound like there's there's potential there for a much broader and or, or a sectoral approach potentially for for application. Um, 
Another question is around how you dealt with um, privacy considerations for participants. Like, was that an issue for people um, around uh, using their data in some way and getting them to sign up and how you manage that? Oh, I'll go first again. Um, uh, so, yeah, we spent a lot of our, uh, it was one of the key topics we wanted to answer in our user research was this idea of, um, you know, if you have live electricity usage of someone's home, technically you could, um, you know, infer things like occupancy and things. And we thought that that would be a really big barrier. It was it was mentioned far, far less than we thought it would. Um, and with far less, uh, I guess, objections than we thought, I think because we were giving people access to their own data so they could see the exact data that we held on them and there was a clear purpose for it um, and the data was was data they didn't previously have about themselves and their household that they were benefiting from. I think um, that's why it was, you know, less of a challenge than we thought. Um, and yeah. Do you think to some extent that there's a trust issue in terms of who who is who is perhaps accessing that data like if it was maybe if they saw it was a different organization that maybe they didn't have that trust with it might be different or mm, you think just yeah, generally I, I, that uh, I think having the council involved definitely helped I mean we weren't the data controller um the Kiwi Power the uh, energy aggregator are the energy um the data controller on the project um but I think that did help that you know the the council are involved and in having you know that element of trust um and I think you know what really helps is that people can see the data that you've got on them. I think that um, when we were working yeah. on other projects where we're collecting data about people, just giving them access to the data that you're collecting um, and showing the benefit to them of that um, has really helped us be able to get these, these projects through. And Diana, data, data and privacy issues for the Lisbon model? Uh, I didn't feel that there was a reluctance for, um, from the, the, the users themselves um to uh yeah, the, for us it was a problem for development because the the law came in force during the uh, development of the app so we had to uh, uh change a lot of things and put more policies and more ways to assure that this uh, uh this was being respected and also it um um uh, so some some of the platforms that we were expecting to use on uh, in, in integrate on this uh, on this um, app were not possible because of privacy issues. So the the platforms of uh, mobility with the uh, e bike the bikes uh, sharing bikes and um, vehicles electric vehicles uh, the charging was possible but not the the renting ones the sharing ones. So, because of these issues, so this is also important thing to address in the future. Great, um, and uh, sorry, this has turned into a bit of an interview session. So, um, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please please post them in the chat or raise your hands. In the meantime, I'm uh, I'm learning more about these things while we're going. Um, also, to both of you, um, what do you think the main motivation for for participants was? You know, was it um was it the rewards was it because it was new and interesting was it because you know there was more of an environmental motivation uh, uh, maybe diana would like to go first this time just to mix it up a little bit <laughs> yeah um uh, i think for uh, the the school uh, motivation the the prize of the school was very important um we had uh, we had two, two levels. No, we had the levels of contributing to the cause of the schools and uh, contributing to myself to my points to get uh, bonuses in the shops, and this was also a possibility to continue this uh, working. Uh, we 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 thought of that without the school prize, just for the shops uh, earning um, points on this, but. Um, I think what was more motivating for for the people using most of the most of the users was to know that uh, this uh, big cause was getting their reward and their school was getting their reward and that that, that really motivated um, a lot of the the competition and it kept it going on for more time. I think it was the most heavy uh, motivation. 
And Gemma? Yeah, so um, this was one of the questions we asked in our survey because we were very keen to know that too. So I can tell you exactly what. Um, so uh, of the people that responded, um, over half of them said that they signed up because of this idea that this was a trial that could help the UK use more renewable energy in the future. So that was people's primary motivation. Um, there was also some people that said that they um, it was to get more information about their electricity usage. So as I said at the moment, uh, previously, the smart meter rollout in the UK hasn't... Uh, got at the speed it, it, it was uh, suggested it would and also doesn't give you that granular detail um, about it um, and then you know rewards are always encouraging I think that um, you know people did sign up for that um, and I think that's what keeps people kind of con to continue to be involved in the services uh, to be able to see the progress and the impact and you know even if they they pass their reward on to our local charity which 92 percent of the people uh, who've taken part so far have um, you know the the to be able to you know see some progress and to see that their their status um i think has helped great uh we had a question from stefano he wants to know if uh it's possible to download the greenwich energy hero for the public is it a, an open access uh -huh. so it is currently in uh, the app store and google play um so anyone can download it it's not going to work unless you have the uh, ct clamp and other equipment installed in your home um so you can download it but uh, it won't work but um so yeah any resident in greenwich uh, could sign up by their by our website to receive the installation um the only criteria was that they had a smartphone and that they had a broadband um, and that they had access to their electricity meter. So we found there were some issues in new builds um, where their electricity meters are miles away and kind of uh, inaccessible in locked cupboards. But basically anyone could sign up in Greenwich, any member of the public. Great. Um, and one of the other things that, that sort of comes up in a lot of um, smart cities discussions these days is the issue of interoperability. Um, it's uh, and, and minimum minimum levels of interoperability uh, within um, the different measures. Is this something that's um, been incorporated into the DSM or something that was considered in the process? <laughs> no one wants to rush at that one. Diana, would you like to start? I, I know you said there were some issues with data around things like e-bikes, with the data sharing element of that. Uh, yes, that's um, yeah, that that was uh, that was uh, an issue, a uh, very important issue actually. I think. Um, um, and also during the the development. That was the uh, the integration with platforms was the, the the thing that took more time to implement. So a lot of things, some of the things only came in action in in the middle of the development of the project and more to the end. So uh, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And um, we would like also to explore other possibilities to operate with other kind of platforms uh, and also to understand uh, other case in, cases where this was uh, possible to, to use and how to, to make this more easy you know, in the future um, because uh, it's uh, one of the biggest challenges for no doubt. Okay, and Gemma? Yes, I think um, our Greenwich Energy Hero was not interoperable and was never intended to be, I think, because we were testing one very specific behaviour um, in one kind of very controlled tight use case um, uh, in a market that doesn't currently exist. But I think, you know, going forward, if we can prove that there is a business model here and the UK uh, power networks agree to fund it like they do the commercial market, you would want it to be interoperable with you know with your smart meter with the i don't know the app that your uh, energy provider give to you um and then you know and we could do more things with points like you know lisbon and milan have done around um you know local businesses so i guess um yeah for for a full rollout we would want that to be you know you'd, you could imagine that being important to the service model but um the way that we designed the project to kind of to help prove the business model it wasn't and never intended to be 
Great. Um, we're just coming to the end of our uh, session, interview session now. Um, and just uh, just finally, from, from both of you, um, what advice would you give to cities looking to replicate DSM? Is there one particular... Um, uh, one particular um, piece of advice or recommendation or first step that you would uh, suggest that cities take if they're looking to do this themselves. Uh, Gemma, do you want to start? So I was finding my unmute button. Uh, yeah, I guess the um, I guess the one piece of advice would be to absolutely not skimp on the user research, especially if you're approaching kind of something that we were, which was a new service that didn't exist in an area that hadn't yet been researched, at least not that much. Um, absolutely, the, as much user research that you can do um, to help you know discover the problem, to discover what people's attitudes are towards it, how they talk about the issue so that you can reflect that in your communication materials, I think is invaluable. I don't think you could ever do too much user research. I'm sure it's possible, but I've never seen it done. Um, I, I agree uh, with Gemma. I think uh, user research is um, a step that uh, is uh, very important. And uh, it is it is important to to study uh, very well which uh, platforms um, we want to uh, address, which behaviors um, we can uh, we want to incentivize, and how can we incentivize this, and then maybe have some plan Bs and Cs for this um, to measure these behaviors. So. Um, so that uh, we don't get, um, uh, so, so we get a, a lot of different, um, more than one way of measuring, so we can have uh, more probability that we can do it in the end. Um, and I think this, um, this question of common cause, as for example, Gemma was saying about uh, that people want would like want to give their reward to the to the charity, for example. I think this is a, a very nice approach. People um, are really, as we also um, saw that during the user research, we concluded that that people really are interested on this, on on contributing to something uh, other than themselves. So that's a a, a good um, way to address it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gemma and Diana, for your um, responding to all of those questions. It was very helpful and insightful. Uh, just to wrap up, um, can you go to the next slide, please, um, Manon? Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. I wanted to thank our speakers, Gemma, Diana and Sandy uh, for your contributions. That's been incredibly useful. And I think uh, we now have a much better idea of what a digital social market is and some of the potential. I think it sounds like there is a whole a whole lot more potential for it to be applied in different sectors, in different circumstances and different ways. And I think that these two um, are great examples of, of that, but we're still in the, I think, in the early days of really um, exploring the potential of the digital social market. So I think if there are particular challenges in your city where you think this might work, um, then uh, I would highly recommend you take a look at the Smart Booklets and the Smart Playbooks on the Sharing Cities website and find out more about how you might go about it. But very much important to use it as a tool for, for tackling challenges in your city and really engaging um, with that um, state, with the citizens or particular uh, sectoral groups. So I noticed that Sandy has put the links to both the booklets and the playbooks in the chat screen. Uh, it's also on the website and uh, it's also on possibly the next slide. Um, can everyone see the upcoming webinar slide? Um, so as I mentioned, this is one in a series of webinars about our um, uh, sharing cities, uh, smart city solutions. We have one in a couple of weeks on e-bikes. Uh, we decided to do this one earlier because as a result of um, in the sort of uh, 
current COVID world that we find ourselves in, cycling and particularly e-bikes are a really important mobility solution, particularly if we want to try and avoid everyone jumping back into their cars and particularly those who now are concerned about taking public transport. Um, bikes have a really important role to play. So we will look at a couple of use cases in our uh, lighthouse cities about e-bikes as well. And then finally, uh, you can see once again, the links to the playbooks and the booklets. Uh, also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and on the website. There are loads of tools and there'll be more being added. Uh, and you can also see in a bit more detail what's happening in our lighthouse cities of uh, Greenwich, Milan, and Lisbon, as well as uh, the work that's being done, uh, very exciting replication work in our fellow cities of Burgas, Bordeaux, and Warsaw. Um, finally, just thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you found it a very useful and insightful webinar and hopefully you'll be able to join us for the others. So thank you very much and have a great day.